Well, we're glad you're with us today. You know, we're laughing in the back. Uh, you know, we had such a great turnout last week and, and the picnic. It was just humbling to see everybody get, get together. But I think, we had, <laughs> I think we had more out at the picnic than we had in here last week. So I, I don't know quite what that means. But uh, anyway, so we're uh, just, just so thankful. We just heard so many great things. It was a great time of fellowship, of, of just getting together and uh, just, you know, as we were praying in the back this morning, it's never, never, never take for granted uh, being able to worship uh, as we do each and every resurrection day on Sunday. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today. Lord, as we reflect on things that have happened today in the past, Lord, we will <clears throat> never, ever take for granted Lord, who you are in our lives, the victory that we have in you, the hope that we have in you. Lord, whether someone's watching today, whether they're here today, Lord, whether it's our kids, our grandkids, whether it's uh, what we hear in the news, Jesus, may we, may we know what to remember. May we remember who we are in you and the times that we live in. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 54, and we're going to look in God's Word today on what to remember as a believer uh, in these times that we're living in. In Isaiah chapter 54, and verse 17, we're going to look at, and um, you know, today is a little bit more, I guess you want to say, solemn, if you want to say it that way, to begin with. I, I, I have to wonder how many churches across America as I drove here today uh, and looking at the different ball fields and all the different sporting events as I drove here this morning that were just packed, that were just all of them and, and a lot of kids involved. And you know I've said that before, there's no, that's all good, there's nothing wrong with that, but when you get to where it's a whole season, I understand tournaments and things our kids are involved with, we've all experienced that, but to, to where it's every Sunday, the, what, are, what are we teaching our kids? And I, and I thought, it, you know, as I can remember 20 years ago when 9-11 happened, how the, the commentators on the news that following Sunday were talking about how it looked like, it looked like a regular work time, day, uh, rush hour traffic in the Atlanta area on Sunday because it, it, they said it looked like Easter. I don't know, we're not, am I here? And Ben's not here to help me either. Uh, I don't know, we all right? You think, guys? Okay, maybe I hit it wrong. I'm hitting it wrong here. Anyways, but they were commenting on... <clears throat> It looked like either a rush hour, 5 o'clock or 8 a.m., or Easter, that there were so many people going to church after 9-11. And I thought about that today as I was driving here. Everything that I saw on the, on the roads that I were on and all the different sporting events that were taking place. And the motto was, we all know that, that what we do need to remember, but the motto at that time was, never forget. Never forget. You know, it's hard to say this, but who would have thought when we saw President Bush at the time and his arm around the fire uh, chief standing on the rebel at 9-11 and giving that great speech to try and calm America of what had happened. Who would have thought at that time, we know the Taliban was involved in all different things and in the Twin Towers coming down, the thousands of people losing their lives, the families affected, that 20 years later that we would be negotiating with the Taliban, with the enemy? I mean, that's what we've heard on the news this last week. And you know, everything's wonderful because we're able to negotiate uh, with the enemy. And I thought, man, what are we living in? And I want you to know today that... that we are at a place to where God tells us what we're supposed to remember and, and, and how the, what we're not supposed to forget. We're never supposed to forget as a believer that we live in a different way. We live in a way that the Holy Spirit is so in your life and in my life, the day that we accepted Christ as our Savior, 
We look at this life differently. We make our decisions differently. And even though we don't know what to do, we still, at that point in time, when everything is just crumbling in around us, we're not sure to, Jesus gives us a peace that the world doesn't know. And we need to be so, so thankful. What, when we look at the sacrifice of Jesus, what does he do once we are a believer? And we know what, why we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's why I always tell anybody that we need to be, as hard as it is, so patient with other people because look what Jesus did for us. Why we were in the midst of all of our mess, he died for us. As he rose from the grave, Jesus gives us victory. And what we need to remember today, look at Isaiah chapter 54. Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 17 in the times we're living in. God's word tells us that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. In other words, we have the hope today that no matter what the devil throws at us is not going to ultimately work. No matter what he does. Now, notice it, it, we hear the first part of that verse often quoted, but we don't hear the second part of it quoted. Listen to what it says, look what God tells us. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment. Now, I want you to remember that today. All of us have things that happen at work. All of us have different situations at, with family. You know, I, I, I see it so much, whether it's at weddings or whether it's funerals, the tension is unbelievable. And someone will pull me off to the side before those things and go, uh, Dallas, we just want you to know that the, this family member here is not getting along with this family member. And they don't go, they, not, they don't talk at all. This person over here, this person over here. And, 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 you know, but what I'm getting at is, is when we have things that come against us that we don't deserve, we don't know why they're happening, it hurts more than even physical pain is what someone has said about us that we know that's not true. Now, that being said, we have to pull back and know as a believer, no matter what's being said, is not going to ultimately come true because it's not true. But right at the beginning of that, it hurts. Because everybody is, is believing that lie of what someone is saying. We have to wait and watch Jesus work in the process. And as we do, he says, and he tells us there, and every tongue which rises against you. You, meaning God, will also condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, meaning God says the Lord. What the Lord is telling us, our, as it says in heritage, our, our, our actually what we inherit from the Lord as a, as, a, as a Christian is to know that we can take a deep breath and know, oh, wait a minute, I don't care what you're facing today, whether it's someone else that's coming against you at work or here, or I, I don't know it, uh, here in your own home or whatever it might be and your kids or grandkids and all the things that are involved when, you know, they get married and all those other things that happen and everything else that goes on and you're just so disappointed, you're so hurt. If we know that no weapon that comes against you today will ever, ever prosper as a believer, we always win. And here's what I want you to get to. You say, yeah, yeah, Dallas, I know. We're going to heaven. It's all going to be great someday. And that's what sometimes you think. I get that. I, you talk to me after the service sometimes. What am I supposed to do right now, Dallas? Okay, all right. Here, here's what I'm telling you. This is what we need to do. What we need to do for today is know today that you've already won. And know today, no matter what is happening, if that battle, it, it, if the dust is not settled yet, Know that the way that you win, that you have peace because the joy of the Lord is my strength. That's what we got to remember. And we've got to know what we see that we're facing today and the time that we're living in and, and every day seems like something else is, is happening. Just know that verse in Psalms that tells us the Lord the psalmist said, the Lord is my vindicator. He is the one that will bring out whatever judgment that needs to happen. It doesn't happen in our time. 
but know that no, no. God wants you and I to remember in the time that we live in because of the sacrifice of Jesus, no weapon because as a believer and as we follow the Lord, no weapon formed against us is ever, ever going to prosper. In other words, even today, it's not going to be effective. You might think and, and, and look at your circumstance and think, man, the Lord's, Lord, why is this happening? It just doesn't seem like I'm winning. I want you to know to go to that verse. And claim that verse and know that, Jesus, I know what you're telling me is true and is real. I'm going to give it to you. And so he tells us. What, what, what else confuses us today is, is we see in this time that we're living in, I want you to be careful of. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 4, in these times that we're living in, what do we remember? What do we need to remember at second, or First Timothy chapter four and verse one. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. What did Jesus tell the disciples? about the time that we're living in right now, about the end times, about the last days. What did he tell them? They were saying, Lord, we know you're leaving. What's going to happen? What's, gonna, what's it going to look like in the end times? And Jesus says this. The very first thing that he says to them, over, he could have said a lot of things. The very first thing he says is, don't be deceived. Be careful. He's telling us to be careful. What, what, is he, what does the Lord tell us right there? He says, with deceiving spirits. You know, as a believer, God equips you and I to know when something is not right. Now, everybody has the knowledge, really, if you want to say, of evil. You know, you, you, we can all go somewhere and we know that, man, that, that, whether someone's saved or not saved, they, you, can, you can experience that presence of evil when you know something is just not right. What God is telling us here is about our spirit, though. See, what the Lord wants us to know is our spirit is as a believer that we know that, that some people that we thought knew Jesus, they didn't know Jesus. And that's, we just have to leave it there. I have seen so much on different pastors and different uh, Christian uh, great Christian music artist in this last year, and all the news loves it. You know what they love about it? They'll get on and they'll say, well, so-and-so, they just don't, they don't believe like they used to. And it's splattered all over the news everywhere. Maybe some of you have seen that. Well-known pastors, and well, well, they just, they believe that there's, you know, now they're starting to believe there's more than one way to heaven. And, and now they're not, and they call it, if you want to know this, they call it deconstruction. In other words, they deconstruct what they thought was true, and then they start over again. God says, that's just not the way it is. Once and for all, he sent his son, Jesus Christ. I don't know what happened to these people. I don't know where they, 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 got, they, they went wrong. And it's funny, somebody said, well, you know, it's interesting to know that they all started to deconstruct their faith after they became wealthy in what they did. You know, where were they when they were coming up the ladder? A lot of truth in that. But what happens is that so many young people, so many young people that, that follow them that are going to start to quit. You, you know, I, I was thinking about 9-11 and I thought that horrific time that took place in our country. Did you know the majority of, of young people, 30 years and younger, know nothing really about it. He's, first of all, because it was 20 years ago. Secondly, that would mean some of them, were, let's say some of them were 10 years old. And at 10 years old, you might have kind of saw what was happening, but you didn't realize the impact. So really, 30 years and younger really don't have in their frame of reference what is happening in our society. When people forget in a society, the sacrifice that someone else had to make so they can live and walk in freedom every day, when they forget that, that nation, wherever it is, falls. It falls. And if we don't believe that that can't happen here, we see it slowly happening before our eyes. I mean, the question to me, so many people ask me, what, you know, we've got the greatest military in the world and all our young men and women that serve faithfully in, our, in, in this time that we live in, in our armed forces that 
and all the retired Navy SEALs and Green Beret, and you can go down the list or say, hey, I'm, I'm ready to go back right now and do whatever we've got to do to get our American citizens and our allies out of there. They, they don't understand. I don't understand. I, I don't know what's happening, but I know this. I know in my spirit, and you do too can pick that up, when something is not right in your spirit. Something is not right right. And we need to recognize that as the time gets closer to the Lord coming back is to know that we see that we're being lied to all the time, not by all the media, by a lot of the media, that we're being lied to every day that we see those press conferences and other things. It's not true. And I want you to know, don't let that happen to where, well, we just go about our day and everything's going to get better. The Lord says, as that begins to happen in these end times and people walk away, what it actually means in original language is depart from the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And we have a world today is not only so much not believing, they don't even know what to believe. And it is our responsibility as all those young people, 30 and under, they really don't know. They, they really don't know. It is our responsibility to love them where they're at, to let them see the truth in our lives and point them to the way of Jesus. They're searching. They're in dark. The Bible says if someone doesn't know Jesus, they live in darkness. And we have the light. Let's look at another verse. What, what, what hope do we have right now? It just seems like, I, I mean, it just seems like I, I pick up that so many people are discouraged. You know, they're just, this, like, again, going back to what you see in the news or what you're hearing about, and, and there's so much pressure in your everyday life, and, and we see more than ever how the, uh, in the statistics and the surveys and the psychologists and the sociologists, all different things of how, whether it's depression or whether it is uh, mental health, people are just so down. Well, because of that's where we're living. I, I, I want to give you some hope today. I want you to know in the midst of all this craziness, I want you to remember a couple things that have just happened and I talked about last week that we still have hope that Jesus is going to have a revival in this, not just this country, but in this world. Now, here's why. I want you to turn to Proverbs in chapter, I believe it's chapter 21. Let me turn here. Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 1. Proverbs 21, verse 1. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. Do you know how, we all know how powerful a river is. It is unbelievably powerful. And the way it cuts through different areas of land. And God says, as powerful as that water is, you know what I can do? Just as I have created all that, I can change the king's heart. I want to encourage you on this fact and give you hope right in a secular society, a godless society, if you will say, that we live in today. I want to give you some hope. Know that in what I said last week, there's two Two things, I, uh, two things that have happened our sight. Don't miss the knowing, hey, the, man, there's some, there's some bright light here. The te- first of all is a Texas heartbeat bill, if you heard about that. And you, and you can look that up, how that if, if a baby is six weeks old in the mother's womb, uh, it's against the law now. They passed in Texas to abort that baby, and, and it went through the court system, and it is now against the law. Also... I said last week, the ruling that MacArthur, John MacArthur's church in Los Angeles, of all places, one court ruling after another that the city and the state fought them again and again and again, that the final ruling was, again, once again, in their favor, in other words, in the church's favor, in God's favor, and the city and the state are now going to have to combine as a total of $800,000 they're going to have to pay back to the church. Now, here's what I want you to think about with that. We're, how did that happen? Well, we know a lot of prayer. and our, that's, that's right. And we didn't give up and we fought. That's right. But God touched the hearts 
of secular people in the court, in the city, again and again and again, in the state, over again and again and again. Many of those people didn't know the Lord. I don't know who they are, but I know many of them didn't know the Lord. What did they do? Our nation was founded on godly principles and were taken into the Constitution. They took that Constitution, they looked at it, and they said, this is right and this is wrong. They went by the facts. And God intervened, and we won great vic- won a great great victory. I want you to know that even in this time that we think that everything that we hear is so bad, those are is what David used to do. Every time David in the Old Testament, every war, every battle that he would go into was going to have to be fought in a different way. Sometimes there were insurmountable odds against them. Sometimes their warriors were tired. Sometimes they didn't know how they were going to defeat all these other different enemies. And in his tent on the battlefield, this tent that they would put together at every battle place that they would usually have in the springtime, in his tent, he would hang something on all the, cor- on the different corners of that tent from the pe- previous battle. He would take something off the battlefield from the enemy that was significant, and he would take that and he would keep it from all the wars that he had, how God reminded him in that tent before he would go to battle, he would look up and in each corner of the tent would be something from that battle and this battle, a victory that God had won to give him encouragement for the next battle that he's facing. Know that as we see those two things that have been won, it's not a coincidence. It's to know that by believers praying and by a church in California said, listen, we're just going to start meeting. And they did. And all of a sudden, people after people start showing up. And they said, for some reason, I don't know why they're coming against us. And they came against us in a hard way in the city and in the state. But God had the ultimate victory. But know that there still had to be a battle. I want you to know We're still in a battle, but I'm glad I'm on the winning side, and I'm glad to know, even though it doesn't look sometimes like it's happening, no weapon formed against you in this day and age that we live in will prosper. It's not going to happen. We need to remember that. I took one more verse, which I said I would talk about as I close this, this week. Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 through 12. Revelation chapter 13, verses uh, 11 through 12. Again, on this time that we're living in and how that we need to see about the end times and what's going to take place. The Bible, God's word, gives us an insight. He even uses that word deception again. Deception means that to, to, to we know that there's going to be a lie in there that kind of somehow can weave it in with the truth, but it's still a lie. You're going to be deceived. In Revelation chapter 13, God tells us to see spiritually. God tells us in the time that we're living in to remember the book of Revelation and to remember what it says. You know, God's word tells us, you know, if you read the book of Revelation this week or over the next month, God says you're going to receive a blessing. If we read what we're getting ready to read in Revelation 13, you're going to receive a blessing. Why is it? I begin to think, what, what is the wisdom about that? Well, we're going to see. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 11, then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercised all the authority of the first beast and in his presence and caused the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast who deadly wound was healed. Wow, that's easy to understand, isn't it? Gee, that's why a lot of people don't want to read it. Whoa, what's going on there? It's very simple. Here's what's happening. It's going to be the Antichrist, the false prophet, okay? We'll just take it that far today. You have the Antichrist, the false prophet, okay? What happens for the Antichrist, to, for us, that, or not us, but for those who are on the earth still at that time during the tribulation, for him to take over, there has to be a consensus of belief. 
of who this is is actually we know he's not Jesus, but they're going to portray him as Jesus. Who does that? Well, the second beast that comes along, what it says there, the second beast that comes along is the one who makes everybody worship the first beast. What it's saying there is the false prophet who comes along is going to, in such a way, bring a delusion across across the globe in a quote, quote, religious way, such a delusion and show signs and wonders that he's going to make those believe that this person, the Antichrist, is, is actually God. That's what he's going to try and do. And he's going to come along in such a way. Here's the deception. It says he's going, to look like a, he's going to be like a lamb. In other words, he's going to be fierce, but he's going to seem like a lamb. In other words, he's not going to, at the beginning, intimidate people. And then through that false religion, he's going to bring them along to where they're going to start to believe this lie. Just because of what I said at the beginning today, we need to remember those that are 30 and under, without us, they don't have a chance. They don't know what to believe. We need to know and to, and, to, and to tell people while we can who Jesus is. It continues, and God's Word tells us, He performed great signs so that even it makes fire, and he even makes fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. In other words, something's going to happen that this Antichrist is going to have a false, if I can say it that way, a false death. No one can be resurrected except through Jesus Christ. He's going to make it look like he was wounded by a gunshot or by something, and it's going to make him look like he died and then he rose again. Look how he's trying to imitate who Jesus is. Can't do it. He's going to try. And as he does that, and people are going to believe, this, this person has to be God. I mean, he, he came back from the dead. He didn't, but it looks like he did. And they're going to make this image, you know, we see and hear so much about 3D or we have our phone today. You can look on your phone today and you can see so many different things. I don't know how it's going to happen. We're going to, going to make this, this image of, of a beast that actually somehow, some way we know that can happen today because of what we see in our phones can actually speak. And all this is going to come together. People are going to say, man, this, this has to be, this guy has to be. God, and there's going to be so much charisma and so much happens. This is all going to be taking place during the tribulation. But God tells us and gives us this insight. He tells us in verse 13, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark on their right hand and on their foreheads. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who calculates or understand, calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of man, which is 666. What is the wisdom that we need to know? First and foremost, I want you to know, because we don't know what's going to happen right now. I want you to know where people have to take uh, the vaccine for their workplace. That's between them uh, and what they have to do for that decision. I, I'm not going to say yes or no, do this or that. I've said it how, how many times it's between you and your doctor, and that's between what you decide as an individual, as a husband or wife, as a family, you decide this certain job, because we're, we're getting there. That's why I'm saying this, to where you might not be able to, to have your job without taking the vaccine. So here's my point. I want you to know if that happens, that's not the mark of the beast. What it is, it's, it's showing us, and again, nothing right or wrong about it. It's just giving us that pattern of where we're going. People are going to get used to, well, you can't go out to eat here. You got to show your your card here if you want to go out to eat, whatever. But what is that doing? It's just a pattern of getting everybody used to is once we are raptured out of this world. Well, you know, here's what used to happen years ago with that vaccine that 
took place. Well, well, hey, you know, I mean, if we got to do this to buy or sell, I got news for those people that live in the tribulation. They can't buy or sell without the mark. I want to know once they do get the mark, they're going to be able to buy or sell anyways. It's going to be so bad. Again, they're going to be deceived. The deception will take place, but they will not be able to do anything. Now, why is that? What's connected with that? when it comes to eternity in heaven or hell? What is connected with this? And how that someone is doomed for eternity in hell once they take the mark? Because they chose to replace the true Christ with the Antichrist. And that mark that is on them in their forehand or in their hand, whatever it might be, shows that my allegiance is to this false Christ. That's the worship of the Antichrist. That's that dooms someone for eternity. And I want to clarify that because I've seen so many things on YouTube and so many different pastors. Know that whatever we're living in right now, this is not going to happen until the tribulation. And thankfully, God tells us that we won't have to experience the hour of trial that comes upon the whole world. We're so great. We're so humble. Now, now what, what, I kept thinking about this over and many times I've read this as we close that. Here is the wisdom. Well, anybody can calculate that in 666. Six, six. What, what's the, what is the wisdom about that? And I honestly believe part of the, what we can know about what God does as far as here is the wisdom. The Lord is wanting you and I to know, just as we read in the very first chapter of Revelation, that there is a blessing when you read this book, when you read Revelation. There is wisdom when we read Revelation 13 because it shows us where we're heading. And because of that, it makes you and I, as we leave here today, hopefully, hopefully live in such a way that we see eternity more than we see retirement. And all the different things. How many guys I know because I'm getting there. How many guys I know that, that retire or whatever. That's fine. I don't have anything wrong with that. But they, they, what, do they do? what do they always talk about? They talk about the past. Oh, it was great when they used to do this at work and that at work. And their family, you know, the kid, oh, you know, the kids are all grown up and the grandkids, you know. It's, not, it's great, but it's not the same, you know, we used to do that. Hey, everything's about the past. Listen, retirement's not perfect. You got all those aches and pains and you can't, you know, you can't do what you used to do. It's just not, it's not, there's deception there. (laughs) Here's what I want you to realize. Here is wisdom. God's saying, here is wisdom. Know that we're headed, we're headed towards the end times. We're living in that way. And God wants us to remember just the same as 9-11, never, never forget what Jesus has done for us. And to know that you have victory no matter what you face. And just as we honored a few weeks ago and these still 13 Marines that died in Afghanistan, we will not forget. Other people might, but we won't forget that we can come on any given Sunday And we can take our Bible and put it on the dashboard and we can drive here without being persecuted. We serve a true and a living risen Savior. And there's still victories today. And to know and to remember in the time that we live in, we are headed, headed quickly towards the end. And to know, to live in such a way that we are light to those that are hurting. That's why we're still here. Yeah, we're still here to be with our families and our, our kids and our grandkids and do what we can to help each other. But we're here as a believer to be light to those who live in darkness. And now more than ever, they're everywhere. May we take that light today. May it be branded in our hearts again and again. That's what's so important of the reminder of being here every week to remember that Jesus died for us, that he rose for him, that we have hope and want to give others hope. Father, we come to you today. Lord, we hurt for those families that are still hurting from 20 years ago. And Lord, we are grateful that for our military and for these young men and women who sacrificed their lives so that we could live in freedom. Jesus, spiritually, we are free because of you. And Lord, if there's someone here today 
There's listening that lives in this country that is scared and is concerned and they don't know what's going to happen. Jesus, let them know that through you, you can save them, you can calm them, you can win all their victories. And no matter how many times we fail, Lord, we can come back to you and you'll forgive us. Jesus, we love you because you first loved us, you died for us while we were yet sinners. Lord, if there's someone here, there's someone watching, may they know that through your word, you tell us that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. Lord, if there's someone here, there's someone listening and watching, may they pray, Jesus, I believe who you are. You are God's son. And you came and lived a perfect life. You died for my sins. All of the sins of the world. And right now, I ask you, Jesus, to come into my heart to forgive me for all of my sins. Jesus, thank you for saving me, for dying on the cross for me. And from this day forward, help me to live by your resurrection power. Father, we thank you for those that are watching or here that prayed that prayer. Lord, we thank you that we as believers are reminded once again that the hope that we have in you, the time that we live in. Father, if there's someone here today that wants to profess you as Lord and Savior, may they come forward and I can show them in your word as we always, always, always give an invitation to invite them to know you in Jesus' name.